Keynes and Hayek head to head. And just to let, let you know what's coming is that I'm going to start out with, with the Keynesian model that you see in some of the textbooks and so on. Uh, and then eventually morph from there to the Austrian view. And n note the changes you have to make to get to the Austrian view and see if you see any, anything wrong with those changes, okay? We see what's going on here. Um, okay, here they are. Keynes and Hayek head to head. It's not really too hard to put them that way. There they go. <laughs> head to head. <laughs> And just a, a brief uh, characterization of both frameworks. Keynes' vision of the economy suggests a circular flow framework in which earning and spending are brought into balance by changes in the level of employment. Not by changes in prices or wages or interest rate, but by changes in the level of employment. Hayek's vision of the economy suggests a means-ends framework, that's what you've seen earlier today, in which the means of production are transformed over time into consumable output. Okay, so that stark difference between the two theories. Now, with apologies to many of you who have had a course in basic macro, and how many would that be? Okay, so lots of apologies here. Uh, we're going to take a brief review of the Keynesian circular flow framework, but you're going to see it. It's going to look a little different than what you've seen in the textbooks. Circular flow framework. And so we have business organizations, which is just a, a facility uh, to bring workers and managers together. Downstairs, we got all the people. We got workers and consumers and investors, okay? And it goes like this. Then we have labor and other factor services uh, being provided in the business uh, organizations. And that's, that's the right way to say it, labor and other factor services, because Keynes, uh, he pretty much limited the input to labor as far as actually modeling it. And he assumed that the other inputs came along with it. Uh, and then we have a reverse arrow that shows the income earned by labor and other factors. Now if you look at the other side, you get goods and services uh, being produced there at the business uh, organizations. And they're bought by this, e, these expenditures of consumer, uh, consumption and investment. So that's, that's the circular flow. Now the thing that's more unique about my circular flow than what's in the textbook is that they circulate. Uh, well, the thing's off right now, I'll turn it on, and you get a circular flow, okay? You see how it works. Uh, it's a little bit lethargic, but you can see why the dial is set to six. You know, the Federal Reserve has the dial set at 6%. Okay, if you want it to circulate faster, just turn it over to the 2%, and you get a fast circular flow, okay? And you, get a, and you get a boom in the economy, and then if you start getting inflation, ooh, you better flip it back or stop it, and then you get a depression, okay? That's, that's the way it works. It's a circular flow. There, there we go. Now, I'm, I'm trying to get it to go right here, okay? Now, Hayek has got a whole different setup, and, and it's all based on this stages of production. So the two, Graphics don't look anything alike, and you wonder how you can start with one and 
end up getting to another one. The Keynesian equilibrium condition, as you have learned in school, is that income equals expenditures. In other words, the circulating that does on the right half has to equal the circulating that does on the left half. Otherwise, you have, uh, you have disequilibrium. And uh, equilibrium condition is income equals expenditures. And for a wholly private economy, uh, the income has to equal consumption expenditures plus investment expenditures. Uh, we could add government spending, but I'm leaving that off uh, in this particular PowerPoint. So you have a ho wholly private economy, Y equals C plus I, okay? Now, we put that on a graph, and, and, and really all we're graphing is the left side of the graph in terms of expenditures and the right side of the circular flow in terms of income. And if the two, thing has, the two things have to be equal in equilibrium, then you get a 45 degree line. That's what the equilibrium is defined as, all right? So the economy is in Keynesian equilibrium somewhere along the 45 degree line. The line itself identifying all the possible income, expenditure, equilibrium points. We draw the consumption equation, the consumption function, which is uh, the, uh, the stable part of the economy as far as Keynes is concerned, although we'll show later that it can change and with consequences. So there is the consumption equation. It's uh, has a lower slope than the 45 degree line, uh, and it doesn't start at the origin. It suggests that even without any income, people have some expenditures, which clues you off right there that it's sort of a short run thing. You must have had some money built up before you lost all your income, uh, and, and now you can still spend. And then the slope is called the marginal propensity to consume, MPC, you've heard about that. And it means the, the slope of that line is lower than one. In other words, yeah, you spend, but you save too, all right? You spend and you save. And the equation of that is C equals A plus B, Y. The A is simply the vertical intercept. The slope is B over one, and B over one is less than one. And then we pile on to consumption investment. So it has that same slope, but only because it's sitting on top of consumption. So investment just is what it is. Uh, it doesn't have any determinants that we, that we can derive from the market process. In fact, uh, it depends on what Keynes calls animal spirit. Investment depends neither on current income nor on the rate of interest. It depends only on profit expectations, which themselves are not well anchored in economic reality. Well, there's a loose joint right there. I mean, some, you know, that's, that's kind of strange. Uh, but it's, that's where animal spirits come in. You, know, you have fire in the belly or not, and so on. So consumption and investment, as well as government spending, are portrayed as additive components of total spending. The three components are distinguished largely in terms of their stability characteristics. So you have consumption, which is seen as being stable. It doesn't move around too much. Uh, investment, which is being, is unstable. And government spending, which I'm not treating in this particular diagram, as being stabilizing, okay? So it's government spending to the rescue, stabilizing an economy that otherwise would be unstable because of the unstable investment uh, spending. Okay. So here, uh, when we see the equilibrium point, uh, and, and we can see it's equilibrium because there's income, the horizontal distance, 
and that vertical distance is consumption and the rest of it is investment. So Y equals C plus I. That gives you the, the stable income. At least stable until investment changes. So wholly private macroeconomy achieves an income expenditure uh, equilibrium when Y equals C plus I. Note that income itself, rather than prices, wages, or interest rate, is the equilibrating variable. You don't have prices changing and interest rate changing to create equilibrium. It's simply how many workers are working, uh, either more or less, and so on. According to Keynes, it is only by accident or design that the economy is actually performing at its full employment potential. And I've had students ask me, and very innocently, well, what's the, what else is there between accident and design? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, the right answer is that it's, it's market mechanisms at work for you and for me. <laughs> so, so in other words, he, he rules out the possibility that there are mechanisms in the economy uh, changing prices, changing interest rates, and so on, that could bring the economy into equilibrium. So we assume here initially full employment conditions prevail if only by accident. And it has to be by accident here because we don't have um, we don't have government spending in the picture, so it's not by design. All right. Now, in this diagram on the right, I'm going to include uh, the production possibilities frontier, although you don't see this uh, in the texts uh, on, on Keynesian theory, okay? And you can see by, by that graph that sure enough, we are in equilibrium, a macro equilibrium. In other words, we're on the production possibilities frontier. So in capital-based macroeconomics, full employment implies that the economy is operating on its production possibility frontier, the PPF itself being defined in terms of sustainable output, levels of consumption and investment goods, okay? And I've even got a labor market uh, that is in equilibrium. I'm being real fair to Keynes at this point <laughs> uh, and, and showing how things work at their best, uh, even if only by accident. In Keynesian macroeconomics, full employment implies that the labor market clears at the going wage rate. Now, that's the term that, that Keynes used, the going wage rate. All right. Uh, the going wage rate itself having emerged during a period in which the economy was experiencing no macroeconomic problems. So you have this wage rate out there, and that's, that's the one we need. That's the one we want. That's the one that's a, sort of a no-problem economy. And the Keynesians sort of keep that in mind when they're trying to fix an economy that's got problems. What should the wage rate be? So labor income, that's Y equals WN. In the U.S., they use, the textbook use N for labor hours. I guess you call it number of labor hours, and so you get the N in number. I don't know how they came up with it, but uh, the hourly wage times the number of worker hours uh, gives you income. Well, it gives you uh, labor income. Uh, is fully representative of total income such that changes in labor income stand in direct proportion to changes in total income, which means that interest income and uh, profits, other incomes, they all, they, they all move up and down with labor income. So as long as we sort of monitor labor income, we know generally what's happening to total income. Of course, that's, that's not right. <laughs> because the, the, the different components can vary one with another. Okay, let's see. So there's labor income. It's that rectangle there, the wage rate times the number of worker hours 
<clears throat> being expended. So Y sub Fe, that Fe stands for iron in chemistry, but it stands for full employment here, okay? It's a full employment income. So Keynes has, Keynes has got it knocked here. He's got everything in doing the right thing. All right. Now, here's my circular flow in miniature, which shows that expenditures equal income. Uh, but it's, it, it's not likely to stay that way because that investment magnitude is uh, not stable. Uh, so what might happen here? According to Keynes, a collapse of investment activity, the collapse being attributable to a waning of the animal spirits. He, he, he used animal spirits three times in a page and a half. That's the primary cause of economic downturns. Well, he hasn't explained much there, you know. You know what are these animal spirits? In response to reduced investment and hence reduced employment opportunities, the economy spirals downward into recession and possibly deep depression. Well, oh, there's the animal spirits. <laughs> Yeah, that would spook anybody, wouldn't it? And when that happens, <laughs> investment goes down. <laughs> now I'm making fun of Keynes, I know, but... And so you can see there's excess inventories there, and you can see them piling up here. So something's got to give, okay? Now, what happens, of course, is the economy crashes and goes to a much lower level of income. And then here's the, here are the little equations you had to memorize and, and uh, use in your quizzes. You have the change in, in, in investment and the change in income that was a result of it. And we can even give the equation delta y equals 1 over 1 minus b times delta i. And we can see that consumption changes too. Not, not that the consumption equation shifts, but you move down it, so you got less consumption. And now what, what we see is worth pointing out is that uh, when something happens bad, then everything goes down. In investment goes down, consumption goes down, the income goes down. Okay, that's that's the way the thing works. And there's see, you don't have any prices or interest rate in this uh, in this equation. The simple interest spending multiplier is one over one minus b, which uh, you can see there in the equation. It quantifies the relative rates of downward and upward spiraling. And now we have the labor market in trouble because the demand for labor shifted down too, all right? Uh, and yet, note that the going wage rate keeps going even after the market conditions that gave rise to it are gone. You'd expect that the wages would adjust to that uh, supply and demand equilibrium. And when you look at the, the whole model at this point, it makes you wonder why he titled the book The General Theory. How general is it? <laughs> now I'm going to skip over here uh, one part just because it's redundant, at least for our purposes. So I'm going to do some morphing from the circular flow to a means-ends framework, starting from the Keynesian view. The nature of the Keynesian style spiraling associated with recession, depression, and inflation becomes more transparent when the production possibilities frontier is in play. And it's me, of course, that's putting it in play, not Keynes. There it is. All right.
Okay, now again, we're going to watch the waning of the animal spirits causes investment to decrease and with it income and consumption. Uh, but now what I want you to look at is the PPF diagram. You know what's going to happen to the other one because you've already seen it. But let's watch the shift. There's the shift in C plus I. And here goes the economy. So what you see, the, the economy falls inside the PPF. Uh, consumption and investment move in the same direction. They both go down together, they both go up together. So there's no way you can move along the PPF. And again, you have your going wage, but it's not in equilibrium anymore. Okay, now we're going to shift again, get even lower, shift down some more, like that. Still, that going way just is <laughs> gone. <laughs> so the further waning sends the economy deeper into the PFS interior. Movements inside the frontier and beyond uh, trace out a linear relationship showing how consumption varies with income. And so watch this in the PPF graph. I, even showing one outside the PPF. Uh, and we can draw a line there, like so. It's called the uh, Keynesian demand constraint. Uh, and you might wonder who named it that, and it turns out it's me because no one else has drawn this diagram. You know? <laughs> they, they, didn't, they didn't get it. Uh, I, let's see, I think I show you here a note that the investment were, if the investment were to fall to zero, the economy would settle into an income expenditure equilibrium with Y equals C, no I. And that I can show you just with uh, see, I thought I had it there. Yeah, that line there, that little white line. That just shows I've got my graphs lined up. That when, there's, when it shows no investment, in the one diagram, it shows no investment in the other one, too. All right? Now, I want to get the equation of that line, and I don't expect you to follow this. It's probably too small for you to see, but we can easily see what's going on. We've got C equals A plus BY and C plus I, uh, and so we've got three variables uh, and two equations. So we can massage those equations and end up just with one equation with two variables. In other words, we get rid of one uh, variable, and that will allow us to show you how, how consumption and investment move with one another. So I do the algebra. It's just simple algebra. You can do it on your own. And it gives you this. The intercept there is A over 1 minus B. The slope is B over 1 minus B. So there's the equation uh, of the demand constraint. Uh, and again, it's an equation you'll never see in a, in a principal's textbook. They just don't do that. Uh, as soon as you see that consumption and investment are always moving together, you see that the, the PPF is really just out of play. I'll skip over this in, in the name of uh, saving time, uh, but these are the numbers that Keynes himself picked out uh, to, to make the point, although he didn't draw the graph. Uh, and he says, he says that uh, there's always an equation of this type, a relationship of this type, meaning that upward sloping line, uh, and it, it has tremendous significance, but no one seems to realize it. All right? Well, of course, the reason you have this line is because the whole economy is hamstrung and is operating with uh, animal spirits. That's one of his examples. Now, let's read this part. The formula is not, of course, 
quite so simple because he, is, he assumed that A is zero and it's not. In this illustration, but there's always a formula more or less of this kind relating the output of consumption goods, which it, is, it pays to produce, to the output of investment goods. And that's what we've done. This conclusion appears to me to be quite beyond dispute. And it's only beyond dispute if you've bought into all of the assumptions that Keynes has made. Yet the consequences which follow from it are at the same time unfamiliar and of the greatest possible importance. And, and of course the importance is that if this happens to an economy, and it surely will, then we need government to the rescue <laughs> to get us back to a full employment equilibrium. That's the story there. Okay, to keep track of possible interest rate movements, the loanable funds market can be brought into view. And uh, Keynes probably wouldn't appreciate this because he didn't like the loanable funds market, uh, but we'll put it into view anyhow. So there's the rate of interest versus savings and investment. You saw that in the, uh, in the earlier model. Uh, upward sloping supply curve, downward sloping demand curve, like so. Though Keynes argued that neither saving nor investment depended to any significant extent on the interest rate, he also argued that both curves, as conventionally drawn, shift together, leaving the interest rate unchanged. So this is why interest rate was out of the picture for Keynes, that he thought these two diagrams, if they shifted, would shift together, right or left, and so the interest rate wouldn't change. Okay, with loanable funds market in play, and I'm jumping the cadence here, with loanable funds markets in play, we see that decreased investment is accompanied by a leftward shift in the demand for loanable funds, putting downward pressure on interest rates. Will we get that far? So here's, so you can see C plus I fell because of the fall in investment, and the, so the demand for loanable funds fell, so it shifted to the left. And at this point, you might think, well, okay, then you're going to get a lower interest rate. But Keynes says, no, before that can happen, the spiraling downward of income implies that the supply of loanable funds, also known as saving, uh, shifts leftward too, relieving the downward pressure on the interest rate. So there goes the supply. And once that happens, the interest rate didn't change. So Keynes says, well, why do we fool with this curve? Because the interest rate doesn't change. Both curves shift together, okay? Now, I, I realized only at this point when I got the, the model put together that that one single diagram in Keynes's general theory, and he only had one, was exactly this demonstration although you wouldn't guess it just by looking at the diagram. Uh, appearing in the general theory is the specific application of the loanable funds framework. The implications according to Keynes is that loanable funds reckoning is at best superfluous. Uh, and this hadn't been picked up just by the, by the textbooks. So here's the general theory and there's his diagram. I could start by asking what all's wrong with that diagram. Uh, on the horizontal axis is R, which actually stands for interest, I guess rate of interest. So that's interest. And what do you see on the vertical diagram? That's a big sin, isn't it? <laughs> I see our physicist uh, <laughs> smiling. <laughs> What's on the, well, you can see it in the, in the passages. Let's see, as shown on page 180 of his general theory, Keynes presented the loanable funds market with the interest rate R on the horizontal axis. He failed to label the horizontal, the vertical axis. The accompanying text indicates that saving and investment are measured there. So it's the same curve I've got, except it's, 
it's backwards, okay? Uh, now, what I want to do, Keynes diagram can be flipped over and rotated 90 degrees to make it conform to modern renditions of the market for loanable funds, and we'll get that. So that's the diagram now with saving and investment and then the interest rate upstairs. Uh, also, two of those diagram, two of those incomes were just to show that income is a shift parameter. So we get rid of that. Okay, now that looks more and more like my diagram. In fact, the only thing different is that he's got the He's got the upward sloping thing sort of backwards as far as bowed out. He's got him bowed the wrong direction, but we'll forgive him. <laughs> so he's showing that both the supply and the demand shift at a rate that keep interest rates unchanged. And therefore, he doesn't need to use this diagram. You can see it over there, too. Keynes also denied, whoop, let me go back. Keynes also denied that an increase in saving would have the effect of um, imagined by the loanable funds theorist. Keynes' paradox of thrift, as articulated in his general theory, is to the point. Every attempt, he says, every attempt to save more by reducing consumption, yeah, that's the way you save more, uh, will so affect incomes that the attempt necessarily defeats itself. This is called the paradox of thrift. And now for the first time, we're going to let the consumption fall. Okay, Keynes thought that was rare, it didn't fall much, it didn't fall often, but it could fall. Uh, and if it does, and it falls because people decide to save more, uh, then that, that really bollocks up the economy. So now almost everything will shift here because that, that constraint up there, that demand constraint, uh, has the parameters of the shift of the consumption function in it, so it'll shift too. So let's make it everything shift that's supposed to shift. It goes like that, okay? <laughs> Don't expect you to fully digest this particular diagram, but you can see what will happen. Okay, the rightward shift in the supply of loanable funds puts downward pressure on interest rates. But, here's the Keynesian part, before there is any movement along the demand for loanable funds, the pressure is relieved as reduced consumption causes income and hence saving to fall. Okay, so the reduced consumption that send the economy into dep depression, income fell, and if income fell, it can't save as much anymore. And so the saving shifts left too. And again, you get Keynes's view that the interest rate isn't affected by that kind of change. I'm watching the clock here. So hence the, par the paradox of thrift. Try to save more and you'll instead earn less. That's, that's the paradox of thrift in Keynes. It's really not a paradox, it's just a result of a absolutely hamstrung economy that uh, isn't directed by movements in wage rates, interest rates, <laughs> output prices, or anything of the, short, of the sort. Okay. Yeah, let's see, I lost something there, I'll come back. To resolve Keynes' paradox of thrift requires that we replace the Keynesian cross, which reflect the economy's circular flow with a Hayek in triangle. Okay, I think I'm in good shape time-wise. Because now I'm gonna sort of step by step show what we have to do to get from Keynes uh, to Hayek. And I sort of reset the, the whole thing where we've got uh, just, the, just the outline of, what, of how things are set up without any shifting at this point, okay? So the level of consumption that appears 
as part of the Keynesian circular flow also appears as the capital-based framework and as the consumable output of a temporally sequenced production activities. So that's consumption in the Keynesian theory. Well, that's consumption at the end of that Hayekian triangle. So let me put that Hayekian triangle in there. There it is. So I have jettisons C plus I plus G and put the Hayekian triangle in. Um, Keynes, however, assumed a fixed structure of industry, which in the current context implies a Hayekian triangle of fixed shape the only live issue being the triangle's size, which, presents, which represents the level of employment and the extent of capital utilization. Uh, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this diagram, this whole diagram here, sticking to the Keynesian principles, but showing how they work out with Hayek. All right. See, we've still got a, a PPF that you can't move along. So, as before, we begin with the economy functioning at its full employment level. The labor market is representative of each and every stage of production that make up the economy's capital structure. In other words, he just had the labor market. And so, to show that, it would look something like this. Okay, it's, it's not stage-specific labor markets, it's all the labor markets, and to the extent they move at all, they move together. Market mechanisms in play here are still those envisioned by Keynes. In accordance with the paradox, an increase in saving causes the economy to spiral down to a less than full employment level. Let's watch that. Okay, there's the increase in savings. And there's the aftermath. And you see the triangle doesn't change shapes. It, it, it can't in his viewpoint. And so it just ends the economy up in depression. And we got less employment uh, to boot. Note that the sole effect of the structure of production comes from the initial reduction in consumption. The derived demand effect works undamaged on all the earlier stages. Right? The interest rate is effectively out of play. The leftward shift of savings took the downward pressure off of interest rates, and in any case, the capital structure is assumed to be fixed. <laughs> so... Is, you know, nothing's going to happen that's good in that kind of a model. Okay, I'm resetting it now. Now, three modifications are needed to transform the Keynesian vision into a Hayekian vision. I've still got, I've got exactly enough time. Uh, and I want you to pay attention to which, what is it that we're revising? and see if you could think of any problems with the revisions. One, divide the structure of production into stages. All right? Well, I think we can do that. There they are. We've got different stages. And two, allow stage-specific labor markets in which wage rates adjust to change market conditions. Okay, we can do that. All right, I'm about to get there. Get rid of the Keynesian demand constraint. And we can get rid of it because uh, now you've got labor markets that change relative to one another. And you've got a triangle that's going to change shapes and, and not just sizes. And in that case, you can move along the PPF. And if you can move along the PPF, then, then that so-called demand constraints out of play, all right? And there was a question about how to get rid of it. We'll try this. <laughs> 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 it's 
It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> and now what you have is a, is, is a Hayekian model. The paradox of thrift becomes a gateway to growth. Okay, a little bit of... <laughs> <laughs> With wage rates and interest rates both adjusting to change market conditions, the economy can move along the PPF and the structure of production can adjust to increase to an increase in saving. You've seen this before, so you'll see it one more time. And there it is. Hayek says, Mr. Keynes aggregates conceal the most fundamental mechanisms of change. Don't want to be too judgmental here. Don't want to be <laughs> Okay, there you have it.